We're at a really critical threshold that makes now the essential time for cities to be leading the effort against climate change. Imagine uh, the entire year's rainfall has happened in a, in a spate of about five to six days. Billions of dollars of destruction of, of uh, infrastructure, human lives have happened. China has the biggest urbanization process in human history. And you can see this is a huge challenge, but you can also see there might be uh, plenty of opportunities for cities to play a bigger role. Cities really are on the front lines, I think, when it comes to the impacts of climate change that we're already seeing, but also in terms of some of the more innovative solutions that uh, are coming forward. And uh, we actually think we have an obligation to do our part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, at the same time recognizing we need to prepare for the impacts of climate change. The cities can be both the problem and the solution to climate change because most of the world's population live in cities and cities stand for most of the emissions in the world today. But they're also close enough to the ground to really drive the new innovations and create the new communities that we want to see. And we're seeing cities from across the world really stepping up to make this change happen. We have implemented a lot of measures to make electric vehicles easy to use and cheap to buy. We are building out our public transport system so that it should be easier to use public transport than your car in the city. And we are building out our bike lanes at a record pace. Many cities are in the process of trying to take in uh, very concrete actions to achieve their picking targets. Obviously, they are quite interested to learn more from international cities. Domestic lighting, that segment is something which appeals to everyone. We are running the largest LED program in the world, which is a non-subsidized program, largely being done at the city level. Recognizing the urgency of acting on climate, our new Clean Energy DC plan actually sets a goal that we'll have net zero energy building codes by 2026. The distance between those commitments and actually implementing the solutions often has a big gap. Well, the Carbon Free City Handbook is really designed to help cities move to action faster. The book, you can see, is uh, quite well received in China, not only because it's readers friendly, but also because its content is quite comprehensive. The handbook has a lot of strategies related to you know, municipal buildings and really using our purchasing power uh, to invest in renewable energy. For us, and especially for cities that are just getting started, I think a lot of the policies in there are really foundational. It is designed around five chapters, around major sectors where people can really impact their carbon. Within each chapter, we have a few recommendations of the top actions that cities can take. It provides a little bit of an overview, these action documents that they can borrow from other cities to start moving their own policies forward and then a few key recommendations and things to watch out for. The Carbon Free City Handbook is a really important tool for us decision makers in cities because we really need to share experiences between cities to know what kind of measures that have been successful and what kind of measures that haven't been that successful. We try to do really in-depth analysis on the international practices and also to the very unique and specific Chinese circumstances. These recommendations build off of each other and they start to create a whole new paradigm for how we're designing our cities in a way that is cleaner, that is healthier, proving the right way to build cities. We've actually seen emissions drop and that's despite really significant population growth in DC. So to see our emissions kind of get decoupled from uh, economic and population growth is really exciting. With more and more people using LED products that were given by us, their preferred lighting shifted to LED bulbs, and which also created more demand from outside what we were doing. And that's how a whole virtuous cycle got created. We can see that a record high number of people are using our public transport system, and that more and more people are um, buying electric vehicles. Any city taking action on these 22 recommendations is now part of a network of other cities across the world that are taking similar actions. And they know that they are part of a much larger solution. We offer to provide any sort of a technical support that is needed by any uh, city government, state government, uh, international government, or anybody else. Green 
action also will better create green attitude. And that's why it's so important for politicians in cities to be brave and dare to take decisions that might seem unpopular at first, but that will also be the future for cities all over the world. This is where cities are headed. This is how cities are going to look in 50 years. One of the challenges and one of the things that we're really interested in as we move towards you know, net zero buildings, uh, carbon-free DC, is how to make sure that everybody is benefiting. It is our uh, duty to make sure that we leave this earth in a better condition than what we inherited. I would also like to invite uh, people from cities all over the world to come to Oslo in 2019 when we are the European Green Capital. The results at the end are not just having checked off the list that we did the right thing. The results at the end are these wonderful cities that are a joy to exist in.